Well, I think people will be coming into the webinar tonight for our Valor at Kahima uh, webcast with Steve Snelling. I'm Rob Lyman. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to everyone as they're joining. We're going to wait a few minutes whilst everyone logs on and we get ourselves organized and then we'll we'll get started. The last time we did this, it took about at just over an hour and we're gonna try and aim to finish on the hour shortly after. If you feel that you want to um, ask questions using the facility on Zoom, then please do so. And depending on how many questions we get will depend on how, how quickly or we, we can answer them or indeed whether we can answer them at all. But do put questions to us as we go through and I'll um, make sure that I pick them up and try and answer them towards the end. So we're just waiting for a little while until everyone has logged on. Uh, take the opportunity of saying hello using the, the chat button and uh, you're all very warmly welcome. Yes, welcome everyone. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today in our second, what is our second Kahima Educational Trust webinar event. We're delighted that so many of you are able to join us today. And I know that many will be watching later on. In April and May 1944, elements of the Japanese 15th Army and the British and Indian 14th Army clashed at the village of Kahima, the gateway between the mountainous jungle region of the Naga Hills and the Brahmaputra Valley, where the main supply depot of the 14th Army was located. The siege and battle lasted nearly three months and many thousands of people lost their lives. The Kahima Educational Trust was founded on the eve of the 60th anniversary of this battle by veterans who wanted to remember their Naga colleagues and to try and repay the debt of honor they felt for those who fought alongside them and took the roles of stretcher bearers, guides and porters. There were many acts of valor during these three months, many British Indian Naga soldiers giving their lives in acts of extreme bravery. Today, we will focus on but a few and I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Robert Lyman who I have to say needs little introduction, an eminent military historian and author of many books, notably Slim, Master of War, and Among the Headhunters are two of many. Rob has traveled throughout Nagaland and Burma researching his subjects and is a trustee of KUT. He's widely sought after as a commentator, so we're very lucky to have him with us here today. This evening, Dr. Lyman will be in conversation with Stephen Snelling, a renowned Norfolk-based writer and journalist, and I will now hand over to Rob, who will introduce Steve in more detail. Rob, over to you. Thank you very much, Sylvia, and a very warm welcome again to everyone who I can see flashing up on the screen. Lots of uh, friends, people who uh, have been on these webinars before, people who we know, and some new friends as well. You're very, very warmly welcome tonight. And uh, it's been billed, I think, as a conversation between me and Steve. I think actually Steve's going to do most of the talking. Uh, and I know you will all find it absolutely fascinating. We are really delighted as a trust to have Steve with us tonight. I've known Steve for many years and we've corresponded on many subjects. He's a journalist by background. Uh, he's written seven books, three of them on VCs, and he is a, an expert on the Victoria Cross. And for a very long time, uh, ever since he was a young journalist uh, interviewing veterans of the war, he, he's had a fascination with the Kahima VC. So he's got an expertise that is unrivaled and uh, we're very, very pleased to be able to welcome Steve to the, um, to the webinar tonight. Uh, we're also very pleased that um, uh, family of the, uh, the VC holders themselves are with us tonight. I'm very pleased that Jack Harmon's sister, Diane Keast, is with us, as well as uh, Jack Randall's son, John. So you're all very warmly welcome. And do feel free, as I said, to uh, articulate any questions you might have in the, uh, in the question box. Before I hand over to Steve, I just want to remind everyone of what a remarkable battle Kahima was. It was one of the great turning point battles of the war. It was very significant in terms of the strategy of the campaign in the Far East against the Japanese. You will know, or most of you will know, of course, that the Japanese invaded Burma properly in early 1942. They pushed the British and Indian armies out of uh, India, out of Burma rather, into India. 
1943 was a little bit of a lackluster year in terms of campaigning against the Japanese. The British and Indians were spent, or spent most of that year trying to find out the best way of organizing themselves and structure, structuring themselves and, and training in order to be able to defeat the Japanese. And that opportunity came in 1944, first in Arakan, and then secondly at Kahima and Imphal. And it's important to remember Kahima and Imphal being two battles in the same campaign when General Mutaguchi bought his very, very large, about 100,000 men by all accounts of the 15th Army into India in order to be able to secure Imphal, but also uh, possibly to, to threaten the Raj. And this is the story of a very significant part of that campaign, the siege and the battle for Kahima, which as uh, Sylvia said, raged for nearly three months from the 4th of April 1944 through to the end of June. It was an extraordinary battle, uh, not just strategically, but in terms of the violence of the, the um, fighting that took place. It was a significant battle in the sense that it involved Indian uh, formations as well as the very famous British 2nd Division under General Blackjack John Grover, um, whose um, daughter-in-law is also with us tonight. Um, it was extraordinary because it lasted for so long. Not many battles last for three months in the same place. It was extraordinary because it was fought through the, the monsoon and anyone who spent time in the Naga Hills in the monsoon will know exactly what I mean. It's a terrible, terrible place to have to fight. Uh, the worst place to fight, in fact, the jungle 5,000 feet up in the cold of the, of the monsoon. It was also significant because it involved large numbers of loyal Nagas who supported the 14th Army in the fight against the Japanese. But tonight we're going to concentrate particularly on two men who were both awarded the Victoria Cross. And uh, as we uh, consider both John Harmon and Jack Randall, we'll also consider the nature of valor. And we want to ask ourselves the questions, why is it that these two remarkable men were awarded the Victoria Cross and others who conducted themselves as courageously and in, in many respects did, did some remarkable things in battle are not remembered. Um, it's the nature of the Victoria Cross, I think, that we, we need to uh, remember as well. The two men who were awarded the Victoria Cross were not the only men who undertook acts of supreme valor during the Kahima battle, nor indeed uh, the other battles of the Burma campaign. We just need to bear that in mind as we go through. But remember, the Victoria Cross is a, an extraordinary award for extraordinary valor. And we're going to spend time looking at that tonight. Now, I'm going to hand over to Steve. And as I do so, he's going to do a little bit of um, logistics to get his screen up and, uh, and uh, show his screen to us. We've been rehearsing this a little bit, and it takes a little bit of time, but he's going to press play. And I'm going to hand over to Steve now by asking Steve about uh, John Harmon. Uh, Steve, tell us a little bit about uh, the Royal West Kent's John Harmon himself. Uh, what brought his battalion and John Harmon to the, uh, the ridge at Kahima, Garrison Hill, on the 4th of April, 1944? Well, thank, thanks, Rob, and thanks to Sylvia um, for uh, <clears throat> inviting me to give this talk. Um, as, as Rob explained there, the, the, the fighting at Kohima was a hugely significant uh, action within the whole context of the Burma campaign. <clears throat> and uh, the, the West Kents really only arrived on the scene at the, at the very last moment, just really before the siege uh, began. The, they barely got in into Kohima before the net closed around the, the, the whole garrison. Um, they were part of a force that was sent in to reinforce the, uh, the, the, the troops, that, the garrison troops that were there, that were certainly not expected to have to withstand a, a, a Japanese offensive. Um, and they, as I say, they barely got in and Jack Harmon was one of them. But to understand, and, and as Rob said, this talk is not so much about 
well, it is about the battle, but it's not simply about the battle. It's more about the nature of heroism and the roots of, of, of heroism within men's characters. And in the people that we are going to be looking at tonight, we have two extraordinary characters in, in all sorts of ways. Jack Harmon, or John Pennington Harmon, as he was christened, but Jack Harmon, as he was known, was the son of a city financier and, con and a man of great conservation uh, uh, sort of spirit, really. He was a years ahead of his time and he fulfilled his great personal ambition in the mid 1920s when he bought Lundy Island. And I will go on just to see some of these pictures. This is just simply a, a, a painting of Jack Harmon's actions, but we'll come back to this. This is the young Jack Harmon. He very rarely looked like this, it has to be said, because this was a very exceptional portrait of him as a young boy. Um, he was never this tidy in any of uh, any other pictures I've ever seen of him. Um, basically, his father had bought and acquired Lundy Island in the mid 1920s and had become known or became known famously as the King of Lundy. And Jack Harmon absolutely loved the island and everything it meant to him. It was, it, it was really freedom in, in every sense of the word for him. Um, he was a very unusual and a very uh, unconventional child. Um, he had run away from school at various times. He, he really could not settle at many schools, many conventional schools. And it was only when he found his way into Beedale School that he flourished. Um, this was an, a revolutionary private school where the focus was on self express was on self expression, um, and rather than classroom activities, he was able to build his own tree house. He had a love of animals. He had his own pets at the school, um, and this was a, a a fascination and a passion that he shared with his father. I'll just go through some of the pictures here quickly. Um, this shows uh, Jack in the middle with his brother Albion and the gamekeeper on Lundy Island. And this, as I say, this was where he was most at home and where he loved to be. This shows him working on the farm, if you like, on Lundy Island. And again, it shows him at the kind of the way of life that he enjoyed most of all. This was where he was most at home. This is a family group, shows Martin Coles Halman, uh, the King of Lundy in the middle. And there you have uh, uh, Jack at the back on the left with his brother uh, Albion and then his sisters uh, with Diana there on the front right. We'll come to this in a bit, bit more, but <clears throat> Jack himself was, as I said, very unusual. The one thing he did not share with his father um, was the sense of focus or application. Um, it was said of him, or he said himself, when I grow up, I don't want to work my guts out. I want to enjoy my life. Um, and he's been described as, variously described as lovable, but unreliable. He was very easily distracted, easily diverted. And uh, he was prone to all manner of fixations and obsessions. Uh, he was obsessed for a period in, in the 20s and 30s with buried treasure on Lundy. Um, he was obsessed with the idea of fortune telling. He had a sort of sense of a mystical quality about him almost, a sense of the, uh, if you like, the paranormal. Um, and um, according to the island's agent, he never could decide what he wanted to do with his life. I think it's telling that he, he never actually had what you'd call a job or a career in the whole of his life. Um, it, it was, a, a, albeit a short life, of course. Um, and they said that the only thing he could decide on, according to the island's agent, was that he looked forward to some stroke of genius, which would provide him with a more than substantial fortune without years of hard grinding work. Um, but I don't think, and this is what I got from, from uh, Diana, um, that this was not to do with necessarily laziness. I mean, she felt that he, his mind simply worked on a different plane to most other people. What is clear, is that he did not settle for a life of privilege, which he, he might well have done, he could have done. He was much more uh, keen on the idea of self-reliance. Um, he was happiest when he was roughing it. He'd once actually been arrested for, for, um, uh, and mistaken for a tramp because he was so untidy. He was walking across the country from his school to go to Lundy. 
and he literally would walk or bike the whole way from the south of England to, to Lundy. Um, he was very much happier living hand to mouth, living off his wits. And in fact, later in the 30s, um, before the war, he had finally decided that he would go off and have an adventure, if you like. He'd already been to Spain um, and, and spent some time there. And here, in the 1930s, late 1930s, decided to travel across the world to Australia and New Zealand. Um, and his passport actually described him as a retired beekeeper, which was one of the tasks that he undertook on Lundy Island. And he traveled across Australia and New Zealand, working variously as a lumberjack, a gold prospector and a farmhand uh, on an odyssey, really a personal odyssey that lasted until the Second World War. Um, now we come to this, this particular picture that we're seeing at the moment shows him as a, about a 18 or 19. Um, it's the picture that was often used around the time that his Victoria Cross was announced. And this was the image that has become famous, if you like, of him. And yet it's nothing like the face of the man that really went to war, if you like, in 1939. We'll see that now. This is the passport picture that he had in 1939 when he was coming back from New Zealand um, to, to, uh, to, to England. But there was about him a, a quixotic quality, really. He was for, um, I think he was forever searching for something and I think for some personal fulfillment which he never quite found. I don't think it was to do with finding fortune particularly. I don't think he was ever interested in, in money or, or, or what wealth. I think he was interested in fulfillment in one form or another. The early part of his war was actually spent back on Lundy Island. Um, and that lasted where he, was, he would be working on the farms there, on the land. And that lasted until nine, November, 1941, when he finally enlisted in the household ca cavalry, actually in the naive belief that he would actually be serving with animals. He thought he would be going to a, a, a horse force or horse unit, um, a cavalry unit. And in fact, he found himself into a mechanized unit. Um, the whole aspect of army life was a terrible shock to him. He, he really did not, it did not fit in at all. Um, his unkempt, unorthodox lifestyle were completely at odds with the military mindset. And his letters home from this period are an absolute litany of complaints about everything. Um, Life is just bloody hell, dirty, noisy, crude and inefficient, he wrote. His complaints went on and on and on. In a series of letters home, he contemplated running away to a life of solitude and he considered seeking a commission. But he was honest enough um, about his strengths and weaknesses to know that he was totally unsuited to being an officer with all the responsibility that that entailed. And he had said, he actually said in one of his letters homes, does the status of gentleman entitle a man to be an officer with the King's commission, though he is not of the soldier type? I think not. His spell fortunately as a cavalryman was short lived. He transferred to the Worcestershire Regiment and then to the 20th Royal Fusiliers. He was posted with his unit to India in 1943, spent a year virtually training uh, in India um, without much uh, with a great deal of frustration, um, but at least he was now in an area and, and, and closer to the wildlife that he actually enjoyed. He suddenly found himself more at home. Um, frankly, he wrote, I'd sooner hear the noises of the jungle than the ceaseless clattering and yapping of the barrack rooms. This was a complete at odds really with what most British soldiers found when they, found, when they were, were posted to, uh, to, to jungle training and also to, of course, to Burma itself. You know, they, they were actually very much um, uh, alarmed by the idea of the jungle. They were, the, the, the noises, the animals, everything was, was alien territory for them. But Jack was very much at home. His first uh, combat, if you like, experience came in the Arakan. He was transferred with about 100 men from, from the Royal Fusiliers to the 4th Queensland Royal West Kents, where they formed D Company, or the bulk of D Company, in the Arakan in late 1943. Um, and they were soon, after Christmas, they were involved in their first actions. And it was then that Jack began to prove himself and to show himself to be something 
rather more than, than anyone would have imagined. Um, he, he, he was had this uh, sense of wanting to go off and, 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 and take part in lonely patrols uh, where the, the sort of thing that would scare most people rigid, he was happiest doing and, and particularly going off on his own. Um, he would infiltrate enemy positions, he would note their strength, he would steal their stores, their rice bags as proof of being there. Um, and it was very soon that, that the people within his unit began to view him with a sort of mixture of awe and certain amount of dread because they, they knew that he was a sort of man who was perhaps a little bit on the edge of danger all the time. Um, in one patrol, one of his earliest patrols, when he was uh, when they were ambushed, everyone sought cover amid scenes of confusion and terror, except for Jack, who was seen standing up on the edge of a chong, coolly returning fire before rallying the patrol and leading them to more covered positions. And this was a, as a private soldier. Another time when a patrol was cut up trying to cross a jungle clearing, it was Jack who found his way across to the men trapped in the open. And one of them later recalled, and I think his testimony is quite uh, telling, he had run across on his own initiative and, the, and without permission from anybody, anybody. Soon I imagined what was going through his mind and realized that our minds were not thinking along the same lines. He was trying to qualify me for a posthumous award whilst I was wondering how the hell we were going to get out of our present predicament. And this was the kind of thing, this was where, where Jack suddenly sort of showed himself to be of some sort of different quality really. Um, interestingly, I don't believe, I don't believe, he, although his actions were, appeared to some people to be um, incredibly um, brave and so on, I don't think they were always entirely reckless. I think that uh, he, he had a self-confidence in his own ability and he knew that if he did the right things, he possibly would get through. I think there was a sense of that. But more than that, there was also deep down a strangeness about him, which was partly born of a, a belief in his own immortality, uh, which is a strange thing to say, but he was, he had seen a number of fortune tellers and he believed that he was going to live until his late seventies, which is what had been assured by several fortune tellers. And he absolutely believed this. In fact, I, I interviewed his uh, company commander, Donald Easton, and he told me of an incident in the Arakan before they moved to Kohima, where he, um, they were both actually crossing a, 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 an area of open ground which came under heavy shell fire. And Jack Harmon turned to him and said, look, you don't have to worry. As long as you stay close to me, you'll be all right because I'm gonna live to be at least 79, 78 years old. So we've got no worries. And Donald Easton apparently said to him, we said, well, you've been told that about you. He said, well, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be safe. So um, it, he had a very strange view of things. And um, it does appear that he, he, he really did believe that he had a certain invulnerability um, to, to what was going on around him. Now we come to, to Kohima, as I say, the West Kents were rushed in at the last moment, really, to uh, try to uh, bolster the, the garrison troops there. And D Company um, were posted onto Detail Hill, uh, and there they were to defend the position against a number of Japanese attacks, in fact, regular relentless Japanese attacks, night after night, day after day. And they'd only been there a few days when they came under a relentless attack at this time. The problem they had on, on, on Detail Hill, as they would find elsewhere, was that they, although they were in positions which had been constructed by the uh, Assam Regiment, um, they included bunkers as well as trenches, uh, the Japanese were masters, as we all know, at infiltration, and they would come in during the night and they would actually try to get between the positions and then make it very difficult for those defenders. Um, on the, uh, the day before um, Harmon began the series of actions which would result in his award of the Victoria Cross, the D Company had had, had to clear this whole position from one set of 
infiltrators. They'd, uh, they'd occupied positions, they'd cleared them out of uh, the bakery, which was on this site. And I'll just show you some of the, some of the sort of uh, details. This, by the way, is Donald Easton, who was his company commander, and we'll, he'll come on to him in a minute. He's seeing him here with his military cross ribbon. This is Colonel Laverty with uh, some of his officers, including Captain Topham, and, uh, and this is his staff, his headquarters staff. And we're seeing here some of the ground. This is, I think that Rob explained was, was from Jail Hill, Japanese infiltration. And here we've got a map which shows something of the positions. And you can see the third hill from the bottom is, is Detail Hill, which was where they were positioned. And this is a more, this came from the book by Lucas Phillips, and it shows you something of the layout of the positions on Detail Hill, um, including the bakery. And you can see there that the, an area shaded, which was overrun by the Japanese at one point. These were cleared out by an attack organized by Donald Easton. Um, and it's almost certain that Jack Harmon would have been involved in this, but not in, a, in, a, in any form of significant way. The problem came uh, on the uh, on the evening um, of the, the 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 day that they cleared this position. They found in the following morning that, that some Japanese were still in position. They were causing all sorts of mayhem. The fire was coming in. They couldn't. No one could move around the position at all without risking almost certain death. Um, and they were discussing, Jack, uh, Donald Easton was discussing what to do about this position, which largely came from one particular position. Uh, it was a bunker which had been built by the Assam Regiment. And uh, Jack Harmon, even before Donald Easton had put a plan together, had worked out what to do. And this is where I say I don't think he was entirely reckless. He actually saw um, that he, there was a way in which he could attack this bunker. Uh, and try to get at it without the Japanese being able to do much about it. Um, I'll describe what, uh, this is what Donald Easton had to say. He said, uh, Lance Corporal Harmon came up and said, sir, I think I know what to do. And with that, he was gone. And this was typical of Harmon, I think. We saw him run forward towards the bunker, which was not much more than 30 yards away, approaching from an angle which enabled him to get under the arc of the machine gun. He then took a four second grenade from his belt, let the lever go, and we could hear him count one, two, three, and then dropped it in through the bunker aperture where it exploded almost instantaneously. He then jumped on top of the bunker, went inside and reappeared with the machine gun. We ran to him and found that he'd killed both the enemy soldiers. In the blink of an eye, the threat to the West Kent had been removed by a single hack and handed act of valor. Um, this, this was uh, not a, an isolated incident, of course. I mean, because the following, following that, that night, the Japanese attacked relentlessly yet again. Uh, attack after attack was beaten off. According to one man, the Japanese were mown down like flies, but still they came on. The following morning, which was Easter Sunday, April the 9th, Donald Easton discovered that there was a new danger from the southern tip of the hill. Again, some Japanese had infiltrated and they'd occupy, occupied one of the evacuated trenches. And together with snipers and machine guns from the neighboring heights, mainly from Jail Hill, were making life virtually impossible for the defenders. Again, Donald Easton began to think, what can I do? What, 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 uh, how can we resolve this situation? And even before he could say anything, he heard someone, and it was a very familiar voice, give me covering fire and then suddenly everything was happening and it was Jack Harmon yet again shouting instructions to his section before fixing his bayonet and charging down the hill. His course took him past one trench and one of those men in that trench was seen to shoot a Japanese who seemed to be on the brink of throwing a grenade at Harmon. Another man was fatally wounded as, they, as he looked up to see what Harmon was doing and crawl and, and, and at that point, suddenly, according to Easton, he saw Harmon leap into the Japanese trench, shoot one or two Japanese, bayonet another, while the rest ran for their lives. That was the, the end of the, if you like, the, the, the significant 
action, but it was not the end of the whole story because at that point, he had emerged from the trench carrying a machine gun. Uh, everyone was calling for him to run like hell to get back to their position because there was, an, there was fire coming in from the other hills. And yet for some unknown reason, which no one could fathom, unless you believe the idea that Jack really truly thought he was uh, immortal, he just walked back, slowly back up the hill to where, he where his positions were. And of course the inevitable happened. He was caught by a burst of fire in the back, which knocked him to the ground. And then you had this very almost celebrated, famous uh, conversation, brief conversation, as Donald Easton crawled out and dragged him into cover. And he called for stretcher bearers. And Jack, East, Jack Harmon knew what was, uh, he knew he hadn't got long left. And he simply said, don't bother, sir. And his last words were, I got the lot. It was worth it. And that was the end of, of, of Jack's life, the end of an extraordinary life. Uh, and I'll go on to talk about the, the actual process in which the Victoria Cross was awarded and the difficulty there was with that. But we'll come on to that uh, it, 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 it later in the, in the talk, I think. Um, but I think that, that's, that was one of the, uh, if not a turning point, because it was so early in the fighting. And as we all know, the, 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 the action of Kohima would go on for many, many more days. Uh, but it was a significant and an inspirational action which did much to lift the spirits of the West Kents and to, to show that they could tackle and beat the Japanese. I think one of the greatest ironies about that story, uh, Steve, is that um, um, John Harmon thought himself to be uh, not a soldier. He didn't regard himself to be a soldier. And no, yet no. he was, he was the perfect soldier. And Donald Eason makes this very clear. He was able to identify what the Japanese were doing. He was remarkably brave. Uh, he knew when to return fire. Uh, he was able to control himself in uh, moments of remarkable stress. And I noticed that Yai is on tonight. Num a number of you will know Yai who uh, walks around the battlefield and leads in fell tours. And if anyone's going to uh, Kahima, then by all means, let me know and I'll put you in touch with Yai. But Yai and I have stood uh, on the road b beneath Jail Hill, looking at the point at which um, the trench, the area of the trench, which is now uh, built up, of course, where um, John Harmon was killed. And you can see from the high ground over from Jail Hill just how exposed he was. But I think, you know, Steve, you're right. He knew that this was the moment, one of those decisive moments in the battle where if he didn't take action, perhaps the entire entirety of D Company, the Royal West Kents, holding this spur against the Japanese uh, push down the hill into Garrison Hill uh, would have overwhelmed them. And it was it was the decisive moment. And I think that's one of the, the reasons why his bravery was so extraordinary. And we'll see this again with uh, uh, John Randall in, in, a, in a little while. Yeah. Uh, it's worth just uh, stopping here and uh, before we go on to the, the next part of the, the conversation to say, of course, the people who were occupying the hill were a mixture of the Royal West Kent, the famous Dirty Half Hundred, 450 odd soldiers from the Territorial Army, um, of which uh, uh, Harmon was now a member, but also of the fabulous 1st Battalion, the Assam Regiment, and I notice a number of people uh, who have joined us tonight whose um, uh, ancestors were in that famous regiment, the newest regiment in the Indian Army, raised in 1941. By the time this battle began on the 4th of April, they had already held off the Japanese at Karasom and Jessamy forward of, uh, of, uh, of Kahima. And we have another amazing story, that of John or Jock Young, uh, late of the Argyles, who was commanding the troops at Karasom, who also conducted himself in uh, an extraordinary manner, a, a manner of extreme valour, and died in holding the position whilst his, uh, his soldiers returned to Kahima to 
restore the garrison. And I think the one thing I, I do want to say before I hand back to Steve tonight is that we need to remember that the, right at the start of this battle at Kahima, the, the fighting on the, of the siege, the beginning of the siege that went on to about the 20th or 21st of April, focused here on Garrison Hill, was fought by men of the Royal West Kent, the British Army, men of the 1st Battalion, the Assam Regiment of the Indian Army, and men of the Assam Rifles, and a whole bunch of other so-called odds and sods, as they were described at the time, from the garrison, who um, many of them didn't have rifles, many of them had never been taught how to fire. And um, they were probably, uh, there's lots of debate about this, but anything between 12 and 1500 men who had been trained to fight a fire a rifle and maybe two and a half thousand in total. But I think the, the point that is worth just emphasizing again is the point at which John Harmon was killed was the point at which it was a point of extreme jeopardy for the defenders of Kahima Bridge. Right, now, I've said earlier that, I think I said earlier that the Battle of Kahima was really in two parts. We've got the siege uh, on the ridge here. And once the siege had begun to be relieved from about the 21st of April onwards, that didn't mean that Garrison Hill was recovered. We then have a period of the battle, which is described as the Battle of Kahima, that ran on really to the last week of June. And it's, it's this that we want to now focus on with the story of John Randall. So I'll hand back to, to Steve now to talk about the second part of the battle. Just the final thing for me, remember that during the siege of Kahima, we saw the Japanese General Sato's 31st Division in the offensive. Their, their aim was to rush the positions on the Garrison Hill, uh, to, to dominate by a weight of um, movement and shock action, the defenders in which they failed. And the second stage of the battle, the one that Steve's going to describe now, and the one that saw the, um, the action in which um, John Randall was awarded his, the Victoria Cross, was when the Japanese dug in. So we see them in the offensive, we see them in the defensive. And in both phases of war, the Japanese were utterly formidable. Steve. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, we'll go on then from here. I'll just, uh, I'll come back to some of these pictures and, and uh, when we come to talk about uh, the process of the award of the Victoria Cross to Jack Harmon. Um, and here we have a picture, a painting of Jack or John Neil Randall, Jack Harmon, earning his Victoria Cross at Kohima. And we'll come on to him. So this is, if you like, the story, Jack's story, and how he came to be at Kohima, uh, and, and the kind of, if you like, something of the character of the man that would be awarded a Victoria Cross. Um, Jack's story, is, his story it has bears certain similarities in a strange way with Jack Harmon, I think, um, but also there are many, many differences. Um, he was certainly from a more conventional upbringing, um, this shows Jack in uh, as a young boy with his two sisters. Um, I think this was about 1929. Um, he was born in 1917 in India, funnily enough, um, where his father was an academic, a philosophy professor at Queen's College in Benares. Um, he was a noted Sanskrit scholar, uh, later became um, the assistant and then the full librarian at the India office um, and uh, they, the family settled in Oxford. Um, Jack went to Dragon School, from there to Marlborough um, and on to Merton College, came at Merton College, Oxford. And I think that it's interesting to, to look at some of, some of his uh, character, if you like, from this period. I'll just run through a few pictures so you get an idea of the person we're talking about. With his pet dog, this is a young man, this is a, a debater, he was a forthright debater. And here we have him as the, the young officer, the, uh, seen there as a, a, a young officer in the Royal Norfolks. <coughs> He was, uh, according to a school obituarist, he was, uh, had a persuasive way about him, which I think is a, a, a way of uh, saying that he was quite uh, determined, I think, in many ways. He seemed generally to know what he wanted, it was said. Um, in, in, at public school, he played all the usual sports, rugby, hockey, water polo, but without particular distinction, I think it's fair to say. He studied law at Oxford, um, 
He was among a, a group of high spirited undergraduates um, who included in one of his closest friends, and this is quite extraordinary when you think of what, what would happen, um, was Leonard Cheshire, who would go on to win a Victoria Cross in RAF Bomber Command. Um, there, are, there are a number of strange coincidences with his life in terms of the Victoria Cross. Um, he studied law at Oxford, and this will be an important aspect of his life in the army as well. Um, and he never, never practiced law because uh, of the outbreak of war, but he would become uh, possibly noted in the regiment, in the, in the Royal Norfolk Regiment in particular, um, for his skill in defending soldiers at various court martials. He became a very popular officer's or prisoner's friend, as it was called, mainly because of his ability to get men off charges for which they had no, seemingly no chance of getting off. Um, he was able to get them off. Um, he was due to have taken up an appointment with the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation in October 1939. But as I say, war, war intervened. He was called up instead, served briefly in the ranks of the East Surreys uh, before being sent to Optu, where he gained a commission in May 1940 in the Royal Norfolk Regiment. And he joined the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Norfolks uh, in the, in the uh, summer of 1940, which at that time, that particular battalion was recovering from heavy losses sustained uh, before prior to Dunkirk in Belgium and France. He was promoted to, uh, to Lieutenant in November 1941, temporary captain January 1942. Um, in that same month, he was married to Mavis Mansa. And four months later, he embarked for India. A son would be born, which he would never, who he never lived to see, called Leslie John. Who was born the following December. What's also interesting is that his brother-in-law, Leslie uh, Mansa, would be killed in May 1942 while flying a Manchester bomber over Cologne in the first 1000 bomber raid and for his actions on that night he would be awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. Um, so you have an extraordinary situation there. His closest friend was a Victoria Cross winner. Um, his brother-in-law earned a Victoria Cross as well. But this is where there is a coincidence, if you like, with Jack Harmon. Just like Jack Harmon, uh, Jack Randall was not really a military man in any form. Um, he didn't really enjoy a lot of the soldiering at that time. He was bored by much of the routine. He hated what he saw as time wasting. Um, and he found very hard to take what he recorded, what he felt was kind of false heartiness in the mess. Um, he found it hard tolerating orders from senior officers who he did not particularly rate uh, in any form and certainly not for their intellectual qualities. Um, one or two of his letters home from India give just an inkling as to his, uh, the kind of, feeling he had about soldiering and he says in this is the July 1943 I get very bored hanging about with nothing to do there is nothing to do if you're not kept fully occupied with training we are all very interested to see the, that the invasion of Sicily has begun at last though we all we are all rather sick at missing everything once more I think he got very fed up with the inactivity um, but we'll come on to that in a, in a minute there was, there was much more as well. His letters are full of that sort of thing. Um, he, his, he hated, he, well, he had a lot of uh, dislike or disdain for the original commanding officer of the Second Royal Norfolks, um, like many other officers at that time. And he said that when he was uh, moved on, he said, old winter has finally cleared off, thank goodness, amidst universal sighs of relief. Um, when, when he was succeeded by a, an officer called Robert Scott, who we'll come on to in a minute, he says that the only trouble is that the new CO is mad about shooting. And every evening he organizes some kind of intercompany shoot. And I get very tired of spending all my free evenings watching one man, man after another shooting off his rifle. 
and this was uh, yeah, he, he was not he was not exactly the the uh, the perfect officer in any sense. In fact, there was wonderful there was a wonderful story when they were originally before moving out to India when the battalion was based at um, near on Humberside on coast defence. Uh, Sammy Horner, who was a great friend of his, who was the signals officer on the 2nd Battalion, he recalled Jack oversleeping and hurrying to make an early parade with his pyjamas showing beneath his uniform. And he said of Jack, he'd lark about a lot and give the impression he wasn't interested, but when it came to it, he was damn good, a damn good soldier. He was certainly uh, a man of robust constitution, and it was his proud boast that he'd never missed a parade or a training exercise through sickness. Um, I'll just give you some uh, insights, if you like, to his character as, as remembered by various officers. His company commander, a chap called Russell Twiddle, he remembered him as a very convivial person off parade with a remarkable capacity for soothing thirst. And on that same, on that same note, a friend called Dickie Davis, who remembered his uh, drinking bouts as a hangover from uh, his hell-raising student days. He said that of Jack Randall, he lived flat out. He could drink six, 17 pints and still stand. I think that there, there were various comments about him. Um, Russell Twiddle again, I could not have wished for a better and more proficient second in command. Red tape was an anathema to him, which he ruthlessly avoided whenever opportunity presented itself. He was a tough man and very well respected by the men, and he was an expert at defending at courts martials. And this was a view endorsed by Company Sergeant Major Bert Fitt, who comes into the story later on. And he had personal reason to remember Jack's special talent. He recalled how during their time on Humberside, he'd, he'd sought to have Jack defend him on a charge resulting from drinking bout. This was turned down because, said Fit, they knew he would get me off. Instead, Jack briefed Fit on what to say and how to handle himself with the result that he escaped punishment despite being plainly guilty as charged. <clears throat> he actually considered, he said of Jack, he thought them, and I think this was a, a very, uh, a view that was taken up by many others that I've interviewed over the years, he said that Jack was a very quiet, very efficient and brave officer who would never ask anyone else to do what he wouldn't do himself. He said he was a man of the very high qualities. And I think had he lived, he would have gone on to achieve some very, office, very high office in his chosen field. And, and, and others who talked about how forceful he was in debate. Dickie Davis said he was absolutely straight. It was black or white with him. He was tough, a wee bit flamboyant, and his men loved him. But when he was mad, he was mad. Heaven help you if you try to argue with him. And uh, something of this was uh, said to me by his, his widow, um, Mavis. This was back in the 1990s when I spoke to her. And um, she actually said that he was uh, utterly uncompromising and exacting but willing to provide help and compassion when needed. So this is the kind of background, if you like, to the man. As for the action on GPT Ridge, well, the story of the, um, the second division, as, as Rob has outlined, was that, the, uh, that they were given the job of cutting behind, they had to trek for something like 10 days through jungle over mountains, to get behind the Japanese, the idea was in initially to strike at Aradura Spur, but this was changed late on, and it was decided that they would attack onto GPT or Gareth, uh, yeah, GPT Ridge. Um, Robert Scott, who was the commanding officer of the Royal Norfolks and a great character himself, he actually said it in a very pithy sort of way. He says that uh, he told, he addressed his men and said, we're going to do a right hook and try and come behind the Japs, cut the road, and shoot them up the arse. And that was the, the approach of his, uh, 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 if you like, his operational command to them. Um, the idea was that they would approach via Oaks Hill uh, and then come down towards GPT Ridge. Uh, the hope was that they would get there unobserved. This, this was not the case. By May the 4th, when they were ready to make their attack, 
it was quite clear that the Japanese were in positions between them and GPT Ridge. Um, one of the staff officers said of the uh, attack on GPT, never did we launch an attack on so little intelligence, but it must be remembered that we deliberately refrained from controlling to gain information in order that we might gain surprise. Unfortunately, they did not have surprise on their side for very long. The problems in the half light of May the 4th, when they began their attack just before dawn, was that they had a tangle of, of undergrowth and trees to get through to, to reach the start line. They were then to wait for an art artillery bombardment of, of GPT Ridge before launching their attack. Um, but as we know, and as Rob has intimated, plans very rarely survive contact with the enemy, and this was no exception. They were forced by the nature of the terrain to advance on a two section front with the rest of the unit following in single file. The actual uh, de attack developed into a series of one man fronts. It was, according to one of the officers, tremendously unpleasant. Um, Sammy Horner actually said it was now only too obvious that the enemy was not only expecting our attack, but st strongly disapproved of it. They came under heavy fire from a number of positions, including bunkers, uh, which they had to try to take before they could even reach the start line. And all of the time they were coming under attack from Japanese snipers. Uh, the shock of this was uh, it's hard to actually um, kind of put into words really, but the, uh, it was an unnerving experience. You imagine that you are part of a group that have been training for something like four years. You've built up a relationship with men in your own companies. There's a sense of kinship and these men are falling all around you uh, and, and you can do nothing for them. At the time, they, they, they had been told that they should attack, they should preserve their ammunition. They shouldn't fire without being able to see targets but they couldn't see anything. They, they were coming under fire from hidden positions. And it was then that Robert Scott gave the orders to simply fire wherever they heard a shot, fire at it and throw grenades. And this had the effect of, of quietening the Japanese to a point where they could at least push forward. They managed to get onto GPT Ridge. And in fact, Robert Scott insisted that they carry on advancing and not waiting for the artillery bombardment. And they were able to capture the ridge the whole thing seemed extraordinary, really. It was one of the great achievements of the whole campaign. They captured the ridge without artillery support. They threw most of the Japanese off, but the problem was that some of the Norfolk's overshot. And it was at that point that the company that Jack was a member of, B Company, lost their, their commanding officer, Russell Twiddle. He was seriously wounded. Um, along with a number of men, they were in no man's land, under fire from snipers, no one could reach them. And it was then that Jack took over the command of the company. He'd already been wounded himself by some fragments of a grenade in his, in his one leg. Um, he could, he was seemed to be limping, but he carried on and he took command and he managed to get the B company back to the, 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 the crest of the ridge. He also was prominent in, in helping to get some of the wounded dragged back from no man's land. And this was just the beginning of what would go on for, for the rest of the, uh, the action. I'll just go through some of these pictures. Here we have um, uh, Jack Randall third from the left alongside Sammy Horner. Here is Robert Scott, the great character of the Royal Norfolk, the commanding officer, who was in his late forties at this time, um, was a man of great uh, physical strength, but also a uh, man of only one eye, in fact. Um, he'd lost an eye. He was a First World War veteran. Um, he'd served in the, in the Irish Troubles, uh, in the Palestine Police. Um, and many, many men said that they were as fearful of him as they were of the Japanese. Here's Jack in India. This is uh, Russell Twiddle, his originally comp company commander on the left with Dennis Hatch and uh, Bill Murray Brown on the right. Dennis Hatch was killed at Kohima on, on the 5th of May. And here we have Charles Barkley, who was one of the officers, uh, one of the young subalterns in, in the action. Um, and uh, I think Rob has uh, something from one of his relatives, um, and which says something about the kind of man he was. 
Well, it's just worth making the point here that um, Charles Barclay was in conversation, again, a, a member of the, the Royal Norfolk Regiment, in conversation with Jack Randall. Jack Randall had been injured, of course, in the legs, and they were having a conversation together on the 5th. Uh, today's the 5th of May, uh, when Charles Barclay was killed. Um, and Charles Barclay was one of three brothers who went to war, and his nephew, Angus, is one of the trustees of the Kahima Educational Trust. I just thought I'd, I'd read a little note that Angus sent me last week, because when we started this session tonight, we were talking about the nature of courage, the nature of valor, what does it actually mean? The reality is, you know, there are many shades of valor, and th this brings it out perfectly. I'll just read this from Angus. Charles's parents, my grandparents, had three sons and two daughters. All three boys joined up. My uncle George, who became a fighter pilot and won the DFC in the Battle of Britain. My uncle Charlie, the photograph here, who joined the army, and my father Richard, who joined the Navy. They all volunteered. My father going straight from school to the Navy in 1944. By then, my uncle George had already been killed at El Alamein. My father much later found out that when he joined the Navy, my grandparents feared that they would lose all three of their boys, but went ahead and supported their son's decisions anyway. My grandfather had been chaplain to a London regiment in the trenches in the First World War, and so he knew only too clearly the terrible risks they would be facing. The support given by my grandparents to their sons was, in my view, amazing valour. I also think that right to mention wives. Uncle Charlie was married with two young sons and to leave his wife behind and to go to war involved amazing valor, both for him and for my aunt Rome, his wife who loved him most dearly. A very, very moving note from, from Angus there about his uncle Charles. Um, it, it demonstrates, yes, of course, that whilst uh, Jack Randall was to receive his Victoria Cross for quite extraordinary valour in battle. The valour uh, at Kahima, displayed here, uh, went much further, uh, of course, and anyone who was fighting at the time and those supporting them at home need recognition as well. Just a very quick point before we continue. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of time. If you'll indulge us, we'll, we'll go on a little bit longer. Uh, just to get, give people a sense of where we are, if you think about Kahima Ridge running down the spur from the great mountain of Pulabadzi, which um, is, as, as you're looking at Kahima from the Japanese side, is on the left-hand side of the Kahima battlefield. The spur that runs down to Garrison Hill was where uh, Jack Harmon uh, was fighting and where he, he died. And then a little bit further east from the, the position of the Japanese, were the Japanese uh, positions on GPT Ridge, another moraine or spur that runs down from Pulabadze, and it was the last major position in the Kahima cluster of defensive positions. So it was very, very significant. And of, of course, as, as Steve has said, the approach to, put, uh, to the GPT Ridge wasn't directly from Kahima Ridge, it was from behind Pulabedse, and the entire brigade had undertaking, undertaken an arduous march in order to be able to outflank the Japanese and come down on them uh, on GPT Ridge from the high ground. It's a little bit difficult to describe without a map. Um, if, if you want to go uh, and do a little bit more research, then there are a number of good books I could recommend. Uh, one which details it in, in uh, lots of detail and, um, and lots of maps, Kahima 1944, published by Osprey, uh, is, is a good one to start, and the KET sell that. Uh, the alternative is to join uh, any of us on a trip to Kahima. I'm planning to go back next year sometime. Steve, let's move on um, back, okay. to, back to the, uh, the, the action that we're describing. Yeah. And so the, the, the situation by the end of May the 4th was that the Norfolks had a hold on GPT Ridge, um, but they were certainly not comfortable on GPT Ridge, it's fair to say. The, 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 the weather, as uh, Rob has said, this was a, a, a terrible time. I mean, the, the positions were awful. The conditions were awful. They could not uh, evacuate their wounded. There was no way to get them out. There was no way to get food in. 
uh, the Japanese had positions which were flailing them with fire. They had uh, snipers in position, which the, the British uh, could not, or the Norfolks could not get rid of. Um, and, and they also discovered that there was a position just beneath them uh, on another neighboring spur called North, which became known as Norfolk Bunker, um, which was also stopping them getting any wounded and rations out. Uh, so they were in a pretty precarious position at that stage. They were holding on, but that was about it. Um, and it was on the following day while they were holding on, in fact, that well, I should say that in a, a brief attempt to clear Norfolk Bunker on the 4th uh, had failed. And, and, and uh, this was led by a friend of Jack Randall's called David Glass. Uh, of, this involved the carrier platoon of the Royal Norfolks. Uh, they were sent out to try to get... Uh, capture the position. At that stage, they didn't know the strength of the Japanese position. They thought it might be just one or two bunkers. In fact, it was a much stronger position. Um, and, and David Glass was killed and a number of men were killed and wounded in that attack and they were forced to pull back to GPT Ridge. Um, on the 5th, they were involved in this, if you like, holding. They were just trying to hold on at that stage. Um, and it was at that point in which um, Charles or Charlie Barclay was killed and, 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 and his death actually underlines just the, if you like, the, 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 the chances and mischances in any kind of conflict. And, and it was Charles who died, but it might have been Jack Randall uh, and he would never have had the chance, let alone the, you know, the chance of winning a Victoria Cross. Um, he would have gone at this stage and I'll read you a letter to show you just how close it was. This was a letter written by uh, Charlie's company commander uh, later in that year to his uh, to his family, to Charlie's family. He says, the fighting had been fierce and Charles had been doing his stuff, ably, bravely, and well as always. I'd just been talking to Charles and, and left him as Captain Randall came towards us. I moved about 15 yards away and with my, was with my back towards him when I heard someone shout. I turned round to see Captain Randall falling down the bank and Charles falling to the ground. As he lay there, a grenade went off beneath him. I reached him in a second, but Charles was dead when I bent over him. Captain Randall was unhurt. The letter continues. I asked Jack what had happened. It appeared that as he stood talking to Charles, two shots rang out and Charles dropped. It seemed that one hit him and one hit a grenade he was carrying in his pocket. And that was how Charles was killed. That, that night, and we'll just go through some of these pictures, this shows some of the devastation in the, if you like, the, the later on in the thing, and it shows you the, the kind of bunker positions that would be have to be taken. This comes on to, we'll, we'll leave that picture there for the moment, we'll come on to him in a minute. Um, but on, on, the, on the evening of May the 5th, uh, Jack Randall was given his instructions that, that he was going to have to lead the remnants of B Company in an attack the following morning to take Norfolk Bunker. Um, now, in order to do that, he felt it necessary to carry out a detailed reconnaissance or as detailed as he could. So he undertook to take this reconnaissance, which was a, a, a difficult and arduous task in itself in the conditions. Um, and it meant braving potentially Japanese fire and, and running into Japanese positions that no one knew existed. Um, but he went out and he went with uh, Bill Fitt, and this is Bill Fitt here, the, uh, Bert Fitt, sorry, who was um, his company sergeant major. Um, and uh, Bert Fitt was a regular soldier. He had served with the 1st Battalion Royal Norfolks on the Northwest Frontier pre-war. And this is him actually in the uh, Indian Hills before the, before the Second World War. Um, he was certainly uh, no, no sort of, uh, um, well, he, he was a tough man, let's put it like that. He was a very tough man um, who had his share of troubles, demotions, but he came back and uh, was regarded as one of the toughest uh, men in the, in the unit. Here we have a, a picture of the, uh, the remnants of B Company. It's not quite clear. This was taken certainly at the time of Kohima, but probably later in the campaign. And it shows arrowed there at the bottom is Bert Fitt. Here's a sort of uh, a map of sorts, which shows you, if you look in the middle of that picture, you can see GPT Ridge uh, and also Norfolk Bunker just beneath it. 
and it's closer to the road that's run through this whole range of, of hills. And this is a plan of the, the fight for Norfolk Bunker on May the 6th. After the reconnaissance, they came back and they had certainly found at least three Japanese bunkers. They, they weren't sure if there were more or not, um, but they'd seen enough to know that it was going to be a really tough task. In fact, Bert Fitt actually later wrote or later said to me, we, we went out to find where they were. We came under fire, but didn't suffer any casualties. We learned sufficient to know that Norfolk Bunker was very heavily guarded. We knew we were in for a bit of a pasting. And that was the, the long and the short of it. And the hours waiting before the attack went in were probably some of the hardest of all because they both, Jack Randall and Bert Fitt, knew exactly what they were going to face the next morning. Um, in, a, in a letter to Jack's widow, his friend Richard Green, who later took over command of B Company and would himself be wounded and decorated before the battle was over, wrote, I spoke to Jack the night before his death and he was exactly the same as he always was. He did not seem to know fear, and yet I am certain that in his heart of hearts he knew he was not coming back from that attack. In a further letter, he said that Jack had told him, if I do not come back, make it all right with Mavis and the kid, will you? And in the word if, I understood Jack to mean when. He never actually said it, but I could read the meaning in his eyes. I think he knew, I think he knew exactly what he was in for the next day. He knew that the, ta the task they were facing was, if not impossible, was extremely going to be extremely challenging. Um, and, and there was no way round other than an, a, a straightforward attack straight at these bunkers. There was no way of getting on top of them in any other way. They were so well positioned. As Rob has intimated, the Japanese were experts in burrowing their bunkers into interconnected positions. Uh, and with one covering another. And even if you ca captured one, you were unlikely to be able to easily capture the second one. Um, according to Dickie Davis, who also spent the night with Jack Randall, he spent, he's, he spent that last night, the May the 5th, with him in their sort of water-filled holes, as he put it, with the rain pouring down. And he says, we talked about our wives, our families. We knew a lot depended on us. I think in many ways we grew up during that night. And Bert Fitz said it was an uncomfortable night. You dug your own foxholes next morning. They were half filled with water. Mentally, the waiting was worse than going into the attack. I laid beside Captain Randall on the forming up position and he told me he'd seen all the past before his eyes. And so had I, every damn thing I'd done in my life. And believe me, I was thankful when we moved. There was an early, early mist that morning. In fact, one of the men described it, one of the officers described it as resembling a Sheringham mist of anyone, if you know, Sheringham on the North Norfolk coast. And they felt it was a, a mist like that. It only briefly began to clear just before dawn. Dickie Davis was in charge of a, 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 the, the, the remnants of the carrier platoon and their job was to give covering fire with as many brain guns as they could muster. Um, and then the attack simply went in two platoons, one going to the left bunker, one going to the right. Bert Fitt was in command of the left platoon. Uh, there was an officer, Lieutenant Roberts, in command of the right platoon. And uh, Jack Randall, apparently, according to um, Bert Fitt, was injured in the advance from the, almost from the word go. He says that, uh, Talking about the whole action, he says, you don't go in, this is Bert Fit. you don't go in for bravery or anything like that. You go in there to save your own bloody neck and other people's as well. And if you're in charge, then you have, you've got to do it. Randall was hit as we were going in. I told him to go down and leave it for the time being, but the bunker was slaughtering our company. It was the main gun position. And he knew very well that if he, if he hadn't knocked that bunker out, it would have been lights out for the remainder of the company. He was hit in the upper half of his body. And yes, I think somehow he managed to pull himself towards that bunker and he deliberately threw himself into the slit to save the remainder of the company. At the same moment as he threw himself in with his dying breath, he, he released the grenade that would blow up that 
particular bunker position. Bert Fitt had gone over to the left. He captured one of the bunkers. The, the right-hand bunker, the main bunker position, as, as Bert Fitt called it, was the one that was causing most casualties. And Jack Randall had just seen the, the, the problem. He'd taken it on himself. I think it was a measure of his determination and his sense of responsibility of trying to prevent other so many of his men being killed that he took it on himself that he had to take out this particular bunker and he did it at the cost of his life um i think that uh, sammy horner summed up that final action when he said that he charged that bunker knowing he must get killed he was that sort of chap and the action was typical of him given a job he'd carry it out to the bitter end and that's exactly what Jack Randall did on that occasion. And um, here we have a, a, a comic strip version of it, but it was simply the story of his charge. And with the bunker position literally slaughtering his men, he felt he had no choice but to carry it through to the bitter end. And that's exactly what he did. This is Dickie Davis, who was uh, who followed up and, and uh, went into the position and helped recover Jack's body. Um, after the action, and here we have the original grave marker. And here is young widow Mavis and his father after the Buckingham Palace investiture. Um, but yeah, I mean, the story of that action is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, and again, it, it didn't completely change the course of events because the fact was that although they captured three of the bunkers, there were more bunkers and the Norfolks were forced to pull back. They couldn't hold that position. Um, it did allow a certain, a certain period when casualties could be evacuated and some supplies brought up to them, but uh, it was several days before the position was truly captured and held. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was not the end of the battle by any means but it was an extraordinary action. Um, I don't know whether we would, whether Rob wants to come in here, but whether we could uh, discuss the fact of the way these Victoria Crosses were awarded. I think it was, um, what, what is interesting to me is the fact that in both cases, we have this strange situation where they weren't necessarily straightforward. Um, in the case of Jack Harmon, you had, and I'm, no one was in any doubt that he performed acts of incredible bravery um, and Donald Easton for one was determined that his sacrifice would not have been in vain so it was an inspirational action as well but there was this sense Donald Easton felt that did Jack Harmon perform a brave deed or was he convinced in his own mind that he was actually immortal that he was not going to get killed so how do you judge that sense of bravery um, so when, when he finished and he spoke, he spoke to his colonel about this whole thing, about whether how, what should they do to recommend him for an award or what? He said that um, Sir Harmon was an extraordinary man who almost thought he was immortal. But the colonel said, when you recommend someone for an award, you judge his actions against other men's behaviour. So in that sense, it was not a question that, you know, somehow because of Jack's beliefs that he should somehow not be put forward for a Victoria Cross. Um, he, he should only be judged by the normal, normal bounds of behaviour. Um, and in that sense, so on that level, it was definitely a worthy action for a Victoria Cross. And um, the recommendation was made and uh, the authorities agreed. And on June the 22nd, the award was announced. Uh, Jack Randall's VC took a bit longer to come through uh, again, no one doubted the uh, extraordinary actions, um, but they, there was a question about that particular VC, not so much whether it was worthy or not. Um, the problem came was that where they were wondering whether there would be sufficient witnesses. In fact, one letter from his friend, uh, Richard Green, he actually wrote saying he fell performing a magnificently heroic deed and it is only fair that we sh he should be put in for the highest award that valor can win in war. But as he said, I'm very much afraid that Jack will not get it. 
as there are not enough witnesses alive. But of course, as we know, fortunately, um, Bert Fitz uh, eyewitness account and the support of his commanding officer, Robert Scott, was certainly sufficient for that award to come through. Um, and and both, both awards were, were gazetted by the end of the year. Steve, thank you very much. I'm very conscious that we have we've run over time, um, although yep. that, that, that's, that's been spectacular. I mean, I, I've just got a couple of very quick observations to make about the, both of the awards, uh, and, and you've touched on them perfectly well. I mean, the first is that certainly with Jack Randall, uh, here we had the actions of a man who had the opportunity of taking cover and doing what Bert Fitt suggested and waiting for the, the stretcher. But he recognised, as did John Harmon uh, a month before, that the battle rested and that that moment rested on uh, his actions. And he knew that those two trenches, those two bunkers, would have scythed the, the company and the battalion apart. And um, it was his duty, as he saw it in that moment, to, um, to sacrifice his life for, for victory. And that's exactly what he did. It was a conscious, deliberate, personal act by a man who was grievously wounded. Mm. The extraordinary thing about John Harmon is that whilst he may well have thought that he was invincible, he wasn't reckless, as we, as we have observed. Uh, all his actions uh, on the day in which he died were, were designed to protect his company, D Company, the Royal West Kents, and to seize the moment that was offered to him. Both incredibly intelligent, brave, and utterly unfathomable actions by men in war. We've really got to wrap it up here. I, I, I just want to say thank you very much indeed, Steve. We could go on for several hours. Um, in, in preparation for this, we were doing a little bit of uh, having a conversation the other night about the number of VCs in the Burma campaign. I think we're going to have to have another session, 29 Victoria Crosses in the Burma campaign from 1943 to 45. Extraordinarily, only 180 or 181 Victoria Crosses in the whole of the Second World War. So I don't want you to think, um, if, if anyone does, that the only valor that was displayed at Kahima was displayed by Harmon and Randall. It was displayed by all of those who fought so magnificently through that long period in those jungled hills to prevent the Japanese uh, domination of the mountains in the middle of 1944. Uh, we've had a number of questions. I, I think, uh, I, 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 We'll have a look at some of the other ones as, as Sylvia wraps up and we'll try and uh, answer them now. But I think it's time to say thank you very much, Steve, and hand back to Sylvia uh, to end this evening. Sylvia, you're on mute. That old chestnut, my apologies. <laughs> I just wanted to say what a brilliant presentation it was and um, judging by the uh, input we've had from all of you out there who've been watching you've enjoyed it and thank you if there are further questions or if Rob hasn't managed to answer them all um, please um, feel free to drop me an email and I'll make sure the question get answered um, by, the, by the relevant person if you would like to know more about our work in Nagaland or about going to Nagaland, do go online to our website, which has lots more detail about how you can support us in lots of different ways. Do also visit the KET shop for beautiful Naga items, as well as books, which Rob's already mentioned. His Kahima 44 is wonderfully stocked with maps and also DVDs. Um, I will say we are a charity and we rely on the generosity and thoughtfulness of our large supporter group. And I'll take this opportunity to welcome all of you who've watched tonight who are new to us and new to the Trust, but also to thank all of you attending today for your ongoing support. Which leaves me to thank you for all for joining us for a small charity. This webinar has been an important step forward in how we communicate about what we do. And I know my father, who is a veteran of the battle and the inspiration behind the founding of KET, would be very proud of the legacy left by all those who fought and gave their lives and equally proud of what KET has achieved so far. I look forward to next time. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you.